In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Happy post-Ash Wednesday, pre-first Sunday of Advent, Lent. Uh, this is Lectio Divina Cotidie. Today I'm going to be offering a brief reflection on, or Lectio Divina, sacred reading of James chapter 1, verse 27. This is uh, the reading from the mid-afternoon mid prayer, or non, as it's called. I'm currently outside on my balcony at my location in Southeast Asia. I don't know if you can see, I've got my Calvary scene back there. It's kind of hard to see with the lighting. Yeah, right there I've got a little statue from Rome of the Calvary scene some cacti and uh, various leafy plants and an orange tree over there at the back uh, or close to the balcony um, this is where I do my out my this is where I get my air and it's, it's really wonderful for some reason at this particular time of the day is when the birds come and uh, they flock and gather here on the barbed wire wrapping up there so it is um, Friday. Uh, Friday is normally a day of fasting, especially during Lent, uh, from meat. Why do we fast from meat? It has nothing to do, I used to think that it had to do with um, deprivation. Okay, it's not like, you know, when you don't eat for, say, a whole day, that's deprivation, right? You're depriving yourself of nutrition and you really feel it, right? You start getting the headaches. You start getting moody and dizzy. Uh, but fasting from meat has, um, and I learned this from a YouTuber, Mr. Taylor Marshall, who was very helpful in informing me about this via his his uh, his channel. I didn't know this, but uh, fasting from meat is actually more of an observation rather than a deprivation. It's an observation, a formal, a solemn observation of the crucifixion because Jesus came in the flesh and so his fre his flesh was crucified on Good Friday so we recall the fact that our the incarnate word was crucified his flesh and meat is a fleshy substance so we deprive ourselves of that in honor of and in worship of the incarnate word the crucified Lord the crucified Lord. So, how do you spend your Friday afternoons? Do you take time at 3 o'clock, especially on Friday afternoons from, say, not 3 o'clock necessarily, but say from noon to 3 o'clock, do you really think about what happened 2,000 plus years ago in, on Golgotha, in Jerusalem? Do we think about what happened on a cosmic level? So with that said, let's go into James, because I think this particular, this individual reading from James says a lot about what it means to be religious, how our, how our lifestyles should look if we plan to be considered religious. I think sometimes we get so lost in the details, we look at the trees and not really the forest, or we see the trees for the forest, not the forest for the trees. We lose sight of the heart. We lose sight of the soul, of what it means to be a follower of the man who came from Nazareth, or was born in Bethlehem. So let's look at this reading, listen to it, James chapter 1, verse 27, excuse me, I just got, maybe it's uh, a sign, I've got a, I had an eyelash <laughs> come out and poke me in the, poke me right on the eyeball, so anyway, I'm okay. Looking after orphans and widows in their distress, and keeping oneself unspotted 
by the world make pure make for pure worship without stain before our God and Father again looking after orphans and widows can you see me looking after orphans and widows in their distress and keeping oneself unspotted by the world make for pure worship without stain before God our and our God and Father okay so here we are back again at what is the essence of worship after all Christianity is ultimately about worship about adoration of a person redemption and all that are the built stepping stones to purif the, the, the purification the sanctification that comes through the grace of the Holy Spirit which we receive in baptism and in a sense that is our ordination that is our ordination to the baptismal priesthood we are a priestly nation we are a nation of people who adore we are an adoring worshiping people without that element of liturgy of constant adoration of the triune God it's worthless everything we do has no purpose our every action should stem from that desire to worship God in spirit without that true spiritual worship the liturgy whether it's the Latin Mass or the Novus Ordus Mass it's all just babble it's the Tower of Babel ultimately if all you bring to it is this superficial desire to just look Catholic on a superficial level to look traditional on that two-dimensional plane all right so let's look at the really look at this text looking after taking care of orphans and widows now you have to remember James was a Jew and to the Jews at the time you see this is the, this is the beautiful mystery of Scripture this was written many centuries ago in a totally different cultural context than our common Western our Western con uh, context modern 21st century Western context but actually it says more it speaks more volumes about now than it did then if that makes any sense I think it says more to us here now than it does than it did back then okay so again with let's hear divina you, you always need to make sure you understand the literal meaning first and the literal would be orphans people who were who don't know who their parents are maybe they maybe they 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 maybe they met their parents after they discovered who their biological parents are but i if you know anyone who's an orphan you you know that the, the the trauma and the turmoil that they must experience not knowing who they come from it's a it's a it's a very psychologically traumatic experience to not know who your biological parents are okay or maybe you did know your parents but they were murdered maybe your parents divorced or abandoned you then you became an orphan so either way being an orphan is a very difficult miserable state to be in especially during the time of James you were considered a loser you were cast into the outer darkness so um, let's let's really put ourselves in that position of being of feeling totally worthless totally insignificant and here we have James in the Holy Spirit saying that we are supposed to look after these people to show compassion to these people and I'm going to get to the point in just a minute here then let's look at widows widows someone uh, a woman or a widower a male who's lost their spouse to death so imagine the loneliness the emptiness and pain that these people felt back then to walk down the streets and have people ignore you and say bad things about you just because you're an orphan or a widow 
it was considered a curse to be that way. So looking after them, showing compassion for them, looking after their spiritual and material needs in their distress, in their distress, he knows that in their distress, looking for that opportunity to relieve that distress. And so here we have showing compassion to the outcast ultimately, showing compassion to the homeless person. Who are the lepers of the 21st century? I don't think I need to list them. I think you know who they are. Who are the people who are considered just not worth it? So the S, if you're truly a worshiper in spirit and truth, then you, and if you don't, if you do not experience a sympathy for the outcast, for the orphan, for the widow then we're dead, we're spiritually dead. And I think that's something that Pope Francis gets a lot of slack for because he does show such compassion to those who are considered outcasts, whether they be homosexuals, homosexual couples, because he befriends them rather than confronts them. I think, uh, you know, even though the, I, I, I'll be the first to question some of the things that Francis has said publicly, but um, I, I, I'm, I always say I think most of it's just media manipulation, uh, the media manipulation of what he actually said. Um, but I don't need to get into that here. But the fact that um, I think that Pope Francis gets a lot of unnecessary slack by the by his trying to live out. He tries to live out this teaching, looking after the orphans and the widows, the migrants who are considered terrorists. No doubt, I'm sure there are some uh, evil elements in that group. But it's very, very dangerous to just to cast everybody in that mold. All right. So, and it doesn't just stop there. Who are the? This is this is where we get into um, the Christological element. Okay. We just started with the literal. Uh, let's finish with the literal here. Keeping oneself unspotted by the world. Okay. We just talked about showing compassion to the outcasts, the orphans, and the widows. Keeping oneself unspotted unspotted by the world. In other words, not letting yourself get influenced by the mainstream culture. Because Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That means that we should never let the world, the secular, materialistic, atheistic, sexually perverted world, we should never let them determine who we are, no matter the price, regardless of the consequences. So I'm looking at my I'm looking at the uh, myself. So it may not it looks like I'm not actually looking at you. I have to look up to the camera to show that I'm actually looking you, you in the eyes. So, all right. Compassion, holiness or lack of worldliness, unworldliness, and then that those two things: compassion for the outcast and holiness separating yourself from the fallen world the world of sin and the devil forgetting about trends forgetting about fads focusing on the eternal values of Jesus Christ compassion and that and Jesus Christ and the, the holiness that Christ requires of us those are what make for pure worship and we saw the same thing, and uh, we talked about the same thing earlier, how um, a sacrifice of praise is more worthy in God's eyes than just someone slitting the throat of a goat and saying, okay, my sins are with the goat. Now, if those things were done in a true spirit, in the true spirit that they were intended, I'm sure that they had some spiritual merit back, back in the Old Covenant. But uh, I think that, that, that was one of the main reasons Christ uh, also came, was to remind us of why there were sacrifices, what they point to, okay? So, compassion, holiness, make for pure worship without stain before our God and Father. So, there it is. I mean, that is the standard by which we're held. That is the standard by which we are held. That we're supposed to be compassionate 
How many of us, including myself, how many of us judge those who we think are heretics or just not up to snuff? And how many of us really take a look at why people become heretics or why people stop living according to the gospel? A lot of it could be because they see nothing but judging people and negativity when they think of the faith. And then... Uh, who are in other in, 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 now we're going to go up a little bit we're going to go up to the Christological level here um, we were orphans we were orphans and widows until Christ came because of the sin of Adam we were the spiritual orphans and spiritual widows we were the, we were the accursed we were the outcasts in the spiritual realm Think about that for a minute, that we were the orphans without a true father. Yes, we had our biological parents, but even our biological parents and all our ancestors stem from the fallen seed of our first parents. So we were orphans. We, we lost our father. We lost our mother. And Christ came... And because of his came as the new Adam, he reestablished that covenant, that family bond with our divine Lord. He, does, he, he through the Holy Spirit that's given to us at baptism, we are no longer orphans, we are no longer slaves, we're no longer widows, but we are married to the church. We are children of. Holy Mother Church, we're children of God, children of God. And so we have to offer that pure, unworldly worship that is soaked, absolutely soaked in the Word of God, because the Word of God is pure. So if you want to be pure, purify your mind and your, your tongue, your mouth, your speaking, with the word of God. Even the gospel, even the gospel, not the gospel, but even one of the epistles, it says to actually speak to each other in psalms and canticles. To let the psalms be part of your daily speech. For example, in the last video, I mentioned how God, God approves of the lowly and afflicted man. Okay? The lowly and afflicted man. Again, here we have outcasts so, and orphans and widows. So let's go on to the the anagogical or the eschatological level. What does this have to do with the end times? Well, sin makes us orphans again. Sin makes us widows again. Even though we're still technically children of God, but on the spiritual realm, in the spiritual realm, when we commit mortal sin, we cut ourselves off from that covenant. We say we don't want, it's like saying we don't want to be part of it. If you read the book of Numbers, there were those who were in the camp, those who belonged to the people of God in the camp, the 12 tribes of Israel, and then those who were cast out into the deserts, the scapegoats, cast out into the deserts, the realms of the demons. So much we can learn, so much we can learn about the spiritual battle from the Holy Scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, how I always think of, if you ever read the book of Numbers, Exodus and Numbers, actually Exodus, Numbers, and Joshua, and Deuteronomy, those tell us a lot about the day-to-day -day struggle as the priestly nation of God, because as you can see, in Numbers, or in the Old Testament, the people of God did get themselves into quite a bit of trouble, even after they were liberated. This is after the Exodus, which shows that even after our true Exodus, baptism, we can fall astray. We can start worshiping golden calves. And then God allows us to reap what we sow. 
So with the, with the Israelites, sometimes it was a, a great chasm in the earth and they would fall into the chasm, as in the case of um, uh, the, the rebellion in the desert. Or maybe sometimes it's poisonous serpents. All of these things point to the, the spiritual realm that the more we sin, it's like we're stepping out of God's camp, out of a, the, the camp of the Israelites, centered around the tabernacle. The tabernacle is Christ. And you're wandering off into the desert, away from the, the priestly nation. And then you become the prey of jackals and demons. It's uh, the, the ancients and the Middle Eastern cultures, they, they understand that in the desert there is loneliness, and because there's loneliness, there's going to be demonic uh, attack, because the demons love to attack when you feel down. They're going to kick you when you're down. They're going to kick you when you're down. And they won't stop until it's over. But we have a great protector. Once we call upon the blood of Christ that we, that we receive through the redemption, through baptism, through the sacraments, and most importantly through true repentance, through authentic, authentic spiritual penance, where you really, really, really in your heart of hearts believe you've done wrong and you really, really humble yourself, God knows when it's real. That's when you're no longer an orphan no longer a widow and then you're readmitted into the kingdom of God into that covenant family the new living temple the new living temple of God the living stone that you are so let's not be orphans and widows and when we meet those spiritual orphans those spiritual widows let's not be so quick to to judge Let's not be so quick to condemn. Because if you'll notice, for James, what makes for pure worship of God is not so much eloquence and preaching skills, but compassion. Compassion. And if you really take that English word apart, compassion, I looked this up, by the way. I'm an English teacher. Come as a prefix means with or along with, right? Computer to put different pieces of information together. Compassion is to literally enter into the passion of another individual. So you weep with those who weep, you laugh with those who laugh, you cry with those who cry, you, you mourn with those who mourn. And the most effective witness the most effective witness that attracts people to Jesus Christ is not so much the volume of the words, but the, the volume of the divine presence of the Holy Spirit that they detect in you. The, 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 the true preacher is the silent paraclete who dwells in you. And if you want that paraclete to work through you, you have to purify yourself for worship through genuine renewal and repentance. And it's not complicated, it's simply realizing I am not perfect. I am a fallen creature. I need Jesus Christ. I need, I depend on Him. It isn't until you humble yourself like that. I think that's the number one stumbling block for most non-believers. I know when I was when I was about this close to becoming a uh, formally becoming a Buddhist, that was my big stumbling block for to come to coming back to Christ. I thought, well, look at look at these Buddhists, they're so happy without Jesus Christ. They can just look to themselves. They look to themselves for enlightenment. But that and, and I, I say this not as a, a criticism of Buddhism. I think there's a lot of spiritual value to things to, to, to the original Buddhism as a philosophy. Uh, compassion is one of the biggest central tenets of Buddhism, compassion. So it's got to come from the Holy Spirit if there's compassion. Um, not saying that it's equal to Christianity, but there are marks of the Holy Spirit in the world religions that we can link, that we can uh, work with as members of the living temple of Christ. Compassion being the first thing, okay? 
So I thought to myself, as a, as, as a potential Buddhist, I thought, look at these guys, they don't need Jesus, but what they have there is more of a natural, a natural compassion, a natural peace. But Christ wants to bring us even higher. St. John Paul II, the, St. John Paul the Great, said in an interview that it's not so much that Buddhism is wrong, but it, it's just that it stops, Buddhism stops where Christianity begins. That Buddhism just stops at nature. All the beauty of nature, all the things we can learn from nature about the ways of God. It stops there, doesn't go any further. It stops there and then it just stays in that cycle of birth and rebirth. And then of course Nirvana. But with Christianity, we go outside of that cycle outside of that cycle so we surpass that cycle by looking to the Christ the Word of God capital W and we look to him to be our archetype to be our essence to be our life in the Holy Spirit and that is the ultimate in my belief that is the ultimate form of self-realization because it isn't so much that uh, we constantly have to belittle ourselves, but more like Jesus wants to bring us up into our true selves because our true identity, our true identity would be the risen Christ. You want to know who you are? Look to the risen Christ. That's who you are. You want to know who your neighbor is? Look to the risen Christ. That's who Christ wants us all to be. He wants to share his risen life so that we can not only become one with him but he can become us through us it's a powerful powerful state of being and it never reaches fulfillment it never reaches fulfillment until the end of time until judgment and by that time it won't even matter it won't matter because he will be all in all. As it says, God will be all in all. But the beauty of it is, here's the real mystery. And it, it, I still can't figure it out. That if we are expected to be temples of the Holy Spirit, if we're supposed to be other Christ in a way, if Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, our true identity, how can we hold on to our individual personalities? That is a great mystery that only God knows how he, we can each be our individual selves and reap all the benefits for ourselves, but only through total abandonment to Christ. Total abandonment to Christ. That is when He begins to make us our true selves. Okay? So I have to underscore the fact, this isn't some kind of New Age philosophy or fake theology. This is pure gospel. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It is He who empowers us through His death and resurrection, through the Holy Spirit that He is, to become our true selves so that He lives in us and we live through Him. But we are still one. It's, it, it's like becoming a trinity. You know, that really, maybe that's what it is. I, I, it's something that I haven't quite figured out, but it's, it's the best synthesis I can come up with from my reflections on the catechism and on the gospel so that's to, I think that's what really that's what Lent is truly all about ceasing to be the orphan ceasing to be the widow because Christ himself looked after us Christ himself showed compassion towards us through his incarnation his death and resurrection so that we can no longer be called orphans but children of the living God in and through the Holy Spirit that He sent among us. So let's rediscover that joy and that peace that can only come through the risen Christ, not in any human man-made philosophy or theology, but only through the revelation of the person, the God-man, Jesus Christ, Son of the Virgin Mary. So I'll close with a reading here, the reading again. It's just, it's just so powerful. So if you want to be, if you want to be effective in your ministry, 
you want to be effective in your ministry, looking after orphans and widows in their spiritual distress especially, and keeping yourself unstained by the world, that will make your worship pure. So let's pray the Liturgy of the Hours, let's pray those Psalms, let's pray our Rosaries, and this Lent, let's make a difference within ourselves and in, and, and in the lives of other people.